Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have uh, Patrizio Frosini here with us today. Patrizio is an associate professor of geometry at the University of Bologna, interested in topology, I would say in general. And uh, what can I say? I've known him for many years, and he has been uh, one of the uh, how can I say, the, 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 the minds uh, that worked uh, uh, as a, at a seminal level on a topic that at the time had a different name, right? I, know, I knew them as uh, size functions, but then the theory grew uh, beyond applications because at the beginning when I was uh, super young, I would say, the, he was working also with Alessandro Verri on these topics and uh, so the theory was expanded quite severely and today is telling us some of the recent results uh, on uh, the use of uh, uh, group invariant non-expansive operators so for topological data analysis and geometric group deep learning. So, thank you, Patrizio. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to be here in uh, Genoa once again. And I'm going to speak about uh, these uh, uh, results about uh, Genius, group equivalent on expansive operators, and the possible use of these operators in, in machine learning. But my presentation, maybe it's better if I take away this uh, mask. I, I do not know if I can. Maybe. Okay. Uh, I'm going to illustrate some mathematical result about this theory. Uh, I, I took a decision of divide my uh, presentation to different parts. Uh, 15 slides about a general presentation of the main ideas, quite informal, without any mathematics, and then some mathematical results. Okay? Obviously, I will hide uh, many details in my presentation. In case you are interested in some detail, please tell me. I will be glad to give you more information about this. Okay? So uh, I, will start, I will speak uh, around uh, 45 minutes, uh, 50 minutes about this topic. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the outline of my uh, talk. I will start by saying something about uh, the key role of observers in data analysis. Then I will speak about uh, topological and metric basics for the theory of genius, group equivalent non-expansive operators. Then I will uh, uh, cite the main uh, properties of uh, the space of genius it is the property of compactness and the property of convexity under suitable assumptions about the data. Then I will speak about methods to build these operators. And finally, I will give you two examples of the use of these operators. One toy example and uh, another example that is uh, uh, more, more serious in the sense that it is something concerning a real application. So, first of all, 15 slides about uh, the epistemology of this approach. We start from data. Data uh, can often be seen uh, as uh, functions, as, as you know. Not any kind of data, obviously, but many uh, kind of data are functions. An electrocardiogram is a function from R to R. A gray level image uh, can be seen as a function from R2 to the real numbers. And uh, a computerized tomography scan can be seen as a function uh, uh, defined on uh, a helix going around the body. For each point uh, uh, along the helix, uh, we have uh, real numbers uh, measuring the quantity of mass encountered by the X-ray beam, okay, going across, uh, across the, uh, the, the body. Okay, uh, in many cases, we have functions as, uh, as data. In our data, we consider uh, data as uh, uh, functions uh, in particular, in this uh, presentation, I will speak about real valued functions. Uh, the theory can be extended to vector valued functions. Obviously, it's is, uh, um, is more complex. But anyway, uh, we, in principle, we consider real valued or vector valued functions as data. These functions are defined on a set, and there is no topology, no metric on the set at the very beginning. The very beginning of the game in this model are the functions representing measuring uh, measurements uh, done by means of uh, uh, instruments or other observers uh, giving us uh, uh, information about reality. So we have uh, uh, this symbol phi that represents in this model the set of uh, admissible data. 
phi is the set of admissible data. Um, this represents, the, as, I, as I told you, the results of, uh, of measurements about reality. Okay? Obviously, if I give you a function, I have to restrict the, the space uh, of data, since if I give you an exponential, for example, for sure it is not an electrocardiogram. Okay? We have some properties, and we have to say what is legit legitimate in this game and what is not legitimate in this game. So we have to say these signals are acceptable in the model. These signals are not acceptable in the model. Okay, so we have this set of admissible data or admissible function or admissible signals, and we uh, wonder what is the definition of similarity between, uh, between signals. Uh, two functions representing signals, data, are equivalent with respect to a group of permutation of a domain if there is a permutation in the group such that the first function, phi, is equal to phi 2 composed g. And similarity is something analogous. When we have that uh, composing uh, the second function with an element in the group, if we have that the norm of the difference between phi 1 and phi 2 composed g is small, then we say that the two data are similar to each other with respect to the action of the group. For example, if I have two images, two pictures of me on the table, and I would like to say, are they similar? I try to make a match. I apply to the second image a transformation that I say it legitimate. I am interested in this kind of transformation. And I try to get a good matching, OK? If I have a perfect matching, I say that the two data are equivalent with respect to the action of the group. If not, but uh, the difference is small, we say that uh, the two kinds of data are similar to each other. So in this game, we have to choose a, 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 an equivalence group, the group that says when two kind of da two data are a, a similar or equivalent to each other. Okay? And this is something that we cannot choose. We have to accept this from uh, the decision of some observers. For example, a physician that tells us that this lesion is equivalent to this lesion. Okay? So you can rotate the picture of a lesion, for example. So we have a, an equivalence group. In this game, the ground truth is represented by the natural pseudo distance. The natural pseudo distance with respect to the group G. What is this pseudo metric? First of all, let me recall you that the pseudo metric is just a metric without the property that the distance between x1 and x2 equal to 0 implies that x1 is equal to x2. We can have two points in the domain that uh, have a vanishing distance, uh, but they do not coincide. OK? This is a pseudometric. The pseudometric uh, I am interested in is this, pseu this pseudometrics. The infimum varying the element of a group of a transformation that we can apply to, da to, to data uh, of the L-infinity norm of the difference between phi 1 and phi 2 composed uh, the element of a group. So we take, uh, we consider the best we can get from the matching, okay? We take every possible transformation, we try to get a, a good matching, and the infimum of this distance, L-infinity distance, is the natural absurd distance. In practice, uh, when we say that with respect to the group, we have a small uh, difference. This means that the natural pseudo distance is small. So there is a, a transformation that almost uh, make the two uh, data coincide with each, other, with each other. OK, so this is the ground truth. But this ground truth cannot uh, be computed in practice. Since imagine I give you a huge group and I ask you to com consider any kind of transformation. You cannot do that. OK? So this is the ground truth, but you cannot compute it directly. You can do that in some simple cases, but not in general. OK? But this is our ground truth. I'm not going to enter the theory of the natural pseudo distance and the properties from, for, for example, from the differentiable point of view. I, I will skip this. I uh, limit myself to say that 
But what happens to the natural pseudo distance when we uh, enlarge more and more of a group? When we take the trivial group, when the group is just the identity, the natural pseudo distance uh, is the L infinity distance. You haven't uh, anything to decide. You have just to, to take your image still, and you have, to you have to compute the difference. Okay? So in case the group is the trivial group, you have this guy. When we take any possible homeomorphism, I forgot to say that in this case we need that x is a topological space. I will come to this later. Okay? For this definition, I need that uh, x uh, is a topological space. If I take any possible homeomorphism, I have uh, this, this value, I get this value, that is the minimum possible value we can get from this game. In the middle, you have the other groups. Okay? When you increase the group, uh, you get smaller and smaller values for the natural pseudo distance. Okay, I will skip this since I have just to cite what is the ground truth in this game. And I start uh, uh, speaking about observers. Observers are quite important in this game. Data have no meaning if no observer elaborates them. Without an observer, there is no meaning for data. Personally, I, I do not know anyone that is interested in data. Everyone is interested in the reaction that observers have in presence of data. I will speak about this later. Okay? An observer, what is an observer? An observer is an agent that transforms data into other data, OK? According to some rule that uh, defines define the observer. That interpretation strongly depends, strongly depends on the chosen observer. When you change the observer, you get different answers from reality. So it's, it is quite important that you define, you choose the right observer in presence of the same data. So observers are not uh, something that is fixed. Observers are variables, OK? The choice of the observer is a variable in this game. It is quite important to stress this point. OK, I, I repeat this since uh, it is quite important. OK, we are hardly ever interested directly in, in the data. But uh, in the relationship between the data and the observer, the pair data observer matters. What interests us, above all, is the behavior of the observer in presence of those data. For example, if we consider someone that, as I told you previously, as a skin lesion, okay, she's not interested in the picture of the lesion. She is interested in knowing if this uh, skin lesion is dangerous. So she is interested in the answer, in the feedback given by the physician, okay, not in the image. Uh, sometimes we say, okay, uh, in, for example, if I am interested in measuring this table, and I'm not interested in quantum theory or something like this, there is no purpose in choosing the observers. You can think this, OK? Sometimes there is no need of choosing an observer. But it is not true. In that case, we have chosen an observer. But the choice is tacitly shared by anyone. There is just one way of measuring this table in practice. OK? So there is an observer. But uh, uh, it is hidden, OK? Um, as I told you, data analysis strongly depends on the chosen observers. If data analysis were not dependent on the chosen observers, then physicians' diagnosis would always be identical. Scientists would always see the same causes for each phenomenon. And all people who would agree in judging who the heroes and villains in a movie or a political event are. It is obvious. It, it's trivial. We know that. Uh, so we are interested, we are mainly interested in the paired data observer instead of data alone. So 
This leads to privilege the study of a form of observers instead of a form of data. In, in this model, the problem is not the one of saying what is the shape of data. The problem is, what is the shape of observers? Okay, this is the main point. I will try to illustrate this in the language of genius. Okay, the group, the uh, uh, invariance group, as I told you, is, is a variable. If I am interested in comparing these shells, uh, maybe I should say the images of these shells, maybe we are thinking of the invariance group as the group of isometries of a, of a plane. I can rotate a shell and the shape is the same, generally speaking. So in this case, I can say that the group could be the one of isometries. But in this case, if I am interested in letters, I cannot choose the group of isometries. I have to, to take another group. For example, the group of translations, the group of deletions, something like this, okay? So the group is, is not established once and forever. It is a variable. So since observers are uh, structures able to change data into other data, uh, we have to uh, formalize this uh, concept. And we can do that by using the concept of group equivalent operator, GEO. What does it mean? It is an operator whose action commute with the action of a group. OK? For example. Uh, take uh, a, 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 a regular function defined on the plane and consider the Laplacian, okay? If you compute the Laplacian and then you rotate and translate the domain, you get the same result that you can get when you rotate and translate the plane and then you compute the, the Laplacian. So the Laplacian is a geo. But the Laplacian is more than that. The Laplacian is non-expansive, so it is a genius, a genio, a group equivalent non-expansive operator. What is the reason of uh, focusing on uh, non-expansive equivalent operator instead of general operators? There are two main reasons. The first reason is that observers are often assumed to simplify the metric structure of data in order to produce meaningful interpretations. What we do when we are in presence of data, most of the time, is trying to simplify the data in order to make that, uh, those interpretable. Okay? Sometimes you make more complex the data. But after, uh, in, during the process, uh, you reach the time where you, you have to simplify your data. At the end, you need to have. Uh, data that are uh, simpler than the original one, OK? So when you compose a sufficiently long uh, sequence of geos, you need to have a genome, OK? And the other reason, this is, not, uh, this is a, a, a reason concerning uh, us as humans, OK? The second reason is topological. Non-expansiveness guarantees good topological properties, and in particular, guarantees compactness. So it's important that we have uh, non-expansive operators. OK, uh, the last slide of informal presentation. OK, so I have illustrate, uh, illustrated uh, my, my, uh, the main uh, mm, points uh, in, in this model that can be described this way. The space of observers is often more important than the space of data. What is the, sp the topology of the space of observers? What is the homology of the space of observers? What is the Riemannian structure of the space of observers? And so on. OK? Uh, the study, for example, what is the curvature of the space of physicians? OK? This is the game. Uh, the study of the space of observers requires the development of a new topological geometric model. OK? The new model could be of great use in data analysis when the role of observers is not negligible. For uh, people that is interested in topological data analysis, 
This leads to this statement. We would like to move from topologic, topological data analysis to the new field of topological observer analysis. OK? After that, I have to move to mathematics, to speak about mathematics. OK? All begins with a space of admissible functions. We haven't anything else that measurements. OK? We cannot speak of anything else of summing, something that we can get from measurements or other observers communicating to us, OK? So we have measurements, functions, belonging to a, a, a set capital Phi. I will give you examples later, OK? That are defined on a set. There is no topology at the beginning of the set. We have just measurements, OK? And we can see x as the space where we can make our measurements, and phi as the space of all possible measurements. We will say that phi is the set of admissible functions. In other words, phi is the set of all functions from x to r that can be produced by our measurement instruments or by our observers. For example, a gray level image can be represented as a function from the real plane to the interval 0, 1. In this case, x is the plane r2 without any topology. Or if I have a laser scanner, I can consider the distances from me. I can move my uh, ray around. In this case, what I'm doing is taking directions. It is point in S2. OK? For each point in S2, I have a number. So my measurements is a, a function on S2. OK? And so on. But now we have. Uh, OK, to consider perception pairs. What is a perception pair? A perception pair is not just data, I mean phi, but phi with a group <coughs> G of bijections from X to uh, X that have this property. If you compose a function in capital phi, a legitimate uh, measurement, with an element of a group, you get another function in your legitimate space. You cannot exit your space phi, OK? Uh, if you add this, you say that the pair phi g, phi g, is a perception pair, OK? Where perception recalls you that you have measurements that are uh, taken with respect to the action of a group. The choice uh, of a perception of a perception pair states which data can be considered as legitimate measurements, the function in phi, and which group represents the equivalence between data, the group G. But in order to proceed, we have to put topologies on X and G. We have no topology on X and G. So uh, before proceeding, uh, I recall you that the initial topology on a set, the initial topology on a set is by definition uh, the coarsest topology on X uh, such that every function phi in our uh, set capital Phi is continuous. Now, we define this pseudometric on the domain X. What is the distance dx between two points in the domain? It is the supremum varying the measurement of the distance between uh, Phi of X1 and Phi of X2. I have a machine, I have a tool that makes measurement, what is the difference between two points? You take any possible measurement, and you take the maximum distance you can get uh, by means of your uh, instrument, OK? If I, have, uh, if I see a difference between two points, it means that there is a measurement making clear that the points are different. If I have two objects, and they uh, have the same weight, the same color, the same position, the same volume, and you haven't a measurement that is able to say the difference, you have to say that the distance is zero. OK? Until the moment, you can get another instrument saying what is the difference between the points. So we have this distance, dx, between points. And this distance, in pseudo distance, induces uh, a, a topology. Let, let me make another example. I, I, I give you the plane. And I allow you just to measure constant function. OK? You have just a poor tool. 
what is the distance between two points? It is zero. Since you cannot see the difference between points, you have just the constant functions, OK? But when you increase the set of measurements, you can see more and more differences between objects. Theorem, the topology induced by this pseudometric is finer than the initial topology on the set X with respect to the uh, set of uh, admissible functions, capital Phi. If Phi is totally bounded, then this topology coincides with the initial topology. OK. The use of DX implies that we can distinguish two points only if a measurement exists, taking those points to different values. Two theorems. theorems. Uh, these are proposition. It is not hard to prove them. Anyway, it's important to cite these properties. Every function in phi is, by definition, non-expansive with respect to this pseudometric. And so it is continuous. So when you have chosen your admissible functions and you choose this, uh, this pseudometric, you, you can say any function is continuous. Any function is indeed non-expansive. And second property, if phi is compact and x is complete, then x is compact. So if uh, the space of data is compact, x uh, maybe is not compact. But uh, uh, if uh, it is not complete, you can complete it. You can compute a completion of the space. And then you can assume that x is compact. So if the space of data is compact, in principle, you can assume that the space, the domain, is compact. In any case, if the space of data is compact. OK, some magic happens now. Each bijection is an isometry in this game. We have chosen a suitable pseudometric, and now every measurement is an isometry. We can consider. Now, the, the, the group, the ij of x, the group of all bijections from x to x, OK? And we can consider, we can select the bijections that preserve the measurements. In the set that when you composed a, me a legitimate measurement with an element of a group, phi composed g, and when you compute phi composed the inverse of g, you obtain another element in the set of legitimate functions, OK? So you restrict the set of bijections. You just take the bijections that have the property of preserving the, the, the set capital Phi, OK? And you can do the same for the homeomorphism. Remember that now x is a topological space. We have defined a pseudometric on x, so we have a topology. Uh, we consider the group of homeomorphism of x, and now we restrict this to the homeomorphism preserving phi. And we do the same for the group of isometries and the group of uh, isometries that preserve phi. So it is uh, immediately uh, evident that these three groups coincide. The group of phi preserving bijections is equal to the group of homeo, um, the group of uh, phi preserving homeomorphism. And this is equal to the group of phi preserving isometries. This is due to the choice of a group X, uh, of uh, the group um, of a topology on, on uh, the domain X. And this is the reason we have ch chosen that topology. OK? This is exactly the reason for choosing that topology. Now we need to have a topology on the group G. What is the distance between two? homomorphism or isometry or bijection, it's the same. You can imagine this definition. It's quite natural. The distance between uh, two homomorphisms can be obtained just by composing each homomorphism with any possible signal. And then you can compute the distance between the new signal you, you get. So you have G1 and G2, for example, two, two permutation of the domain. You, you test this homeomorphism by composing with any possible signal, and then you consider the distance between phi 
compose G1 and phi compose G2. And the supremum of the distance between uh, these two signals is the distance between the element of a group. Theorem, G is a topological group with respect to this pseudometric, and the action of the group on the set of legitimate signals by right composition is continuous. And another theorem, as happens for the domain, you remember the previous proposition, if phi is compact and G is complete, then G is compact. If G is not complete, you can complete it. So if phi is the set of data is compact, you can assume that both the domain of the data and the group are compact. And this is quite important for approximation, for example. OK, geos and genios. Now I'm going to illustrate this concept uh, formally. OK, we have perception pairs, pairs phi G, where phi is preserved by the action of a group G. And uh, we have a group homomorphism, T, between the two groups a homomorphism from G to H. We say that F from phi to psi, the set of admissible functions for the first pair and the set of admissible functions for the other pair, we say that F is uh, a geo, a group equivalent operator, if this equality, this equality here, here holds, okay? So you have that the action of a group commutes with uh, the application of the operator, OK? Think uh, about the example of, of the Laplacian I told you previously. But in that case, the situation is in some sense trivial. Since we have just one group, the group of isometries, in the first pair and in the other pair. In the general case, we have to consider a homomorphism. And F is a genio, that is a non-expansive geo, if we have this inequality, the distance between the new data after applying F is less than the distance between the original data. OK? The G, Genio, in some sense, is the uh, representation of the observer in this game. OK? Just an example. An example of Genio, in order to make the definition clear. In this case, we have the Earth at two different days with a different distribution of the temperature. And we would like to, uh, to compute the difference between the temperature. Are they similar or not? Different days, OK? Assume that we can recognize the North Pole and the South Pole, but we cannot see the countries, OK? Just the two poles. And we have functions, OK, def uh, defined on, on this surface, that is S2, OK? And we would like to compare these two functions, OK? So we can consider these two perception pairs. The first perception pair is this one. We take uh, phi g, where phi is x uh, is, is uh, the surface of the Earth, S2, OK? Phi is the set of one Lipschitz functions from S2 to a fixed interval A, B. A is the minimum temperature uh, I can guess to measure on the Earth, and B is the maximum temperature, OK? And G is the group of rotation, uh, rotations of S2 around the north pole, south pole axis. So we can rotate the, the Earth. And we can do the same for the equator. OK, so we have a, a, a a perception pair phi g, uh, since uh, the set phi is preserved by rotations. And we can do the same for the equator y, that is S1 embedded in S2. OK? This is the equator. Psi is a set of Wallipschitz functions from the equator to the intervals a, b. And h is the group of rotations of the equator. Now we have two perception pairs, and we can speak about, uh, we can consider an example of Genio. Uh, we have to fix a homomorphism between the group of rotations of the Earth and the group of rotations of the equator. And in this case, it's quite natural. Obviously, there are plenty of uh, different choices, but 
uh, in this uh, case, it's natural to consider the uh, homomorphisms taking the rotation of alpha degrees of the Earth into the rotation of alpha degrees of the equator. Okay? So in this case, T is just an isomorphism. Okay? And we can consider F uh, phi defined this way. We have to define, the, we have a temperature phi defined uh, over the Earth, and we have to transform it into simpler data, a function defined on the equator. In this case, I have chosen to take the average along a meridian of this temperature. So I have a distribution of temperatures. I compute for each point on the equator, I take the meridian. I consider the average along the meridian, and this is the value at this point. So I transform, I can transform the distribution of temperature uh, on, on the Earth into a distribution of temperature on, on uh, the equator. And this is the reason of considering genius, simplifying, in some sense, information. OK? OK, this is an example of Genio. Compact, uh, compactness and convexity. Uh, mm, these are two uh, relevant uh, results. Uh, the first one uh, requires some, uh, it, it is not immediate, okay? The second result is trivial, okay? I can read this by, uh, um, first of all, I have to tell you what is uh, uh, maybe the most natural definition of uh, a pseudometric between uh, genius. What is the pseudometric, the distance between two genius F1 and F2? You have just, uh, you can consider the, the image uh, by F1 and F2 of any possible data in your legitimate space uh, of functions that is not a vector space in general. Phi is not a, a vector space in general. It is a topological space. We can consider the distance between F1 of phi, F2 of phi, and we can compute the supremum. If we consider the topology associated to this pseudometric and the other topologies I have spoken about, we have this result. If phi and psi, the data, the space of data, are compact, then the space of genius is compact too. This is, if you reflect about this, uh, maybe it's a little bit weird. Since we are, um, we consider, we usually consider that uh, there is no link between data and observers. The space of data can be quite simple, and the space of observers, for example, humans, can be quite uh, complex, or vice versa. We can have a trivial observator and a space of signals that is uh, quite involved. It can happen. But in this model, when we use the topologies I have uh, illustrated, we have that if the space of data is compact, the space of observer is compact too. This is quite important, since compactness means that we can approximate the space with a finite set of points. This is trivial. If psi is complex, uh, the space of data we, we can reach, then the space of genius is convex. Uh, uh, together, this means that, imagine, what is our game? Maybe it's better if I give you a simple example. We have a space of uh, mathematical observers, genius, here. And I have an external point that is a physician. Okay? I would like to uh, look for the best approximation in the space of a physician in order to have similar uh, feedback from data, for example, for the skin lesion. So I have to try to minimize some loss function on the space of genius, looking for, in some sense, the best approximation of a physician that is outside the space. Okay? If we have, a, obviously, I am saying something that is quite strong, uh, uh, but if you have a, a strictly convex functions representing the loss, since the space of genius is, with respect to the topologies I, I have suggested, um, compact and convex with respect to, uh, under the assumption that the, the data are, are, are compact and convex, we have that there is just one genio that is the best approximation of a, of a physician. So the model, it's quite important that these two properties hold. 
After saying that, I have to say something about the methods to build genius. Uh, first of all, I, I will illustrate uh, some trivial methods, and then a method that is not trivial, uh, that can be used to build genius. Since the matter is like this, I will give you some exa an example at, uh, at the end. Okay, uh, I am here, and someone asks me to approximate the external observers. I need to produce family of genius in order to combine them to get a good approximation of external observers. So I need methods to, to, to build genius. The idea is having a good theory for this kind of Lego bricks to put together to build good approximation of uh, the external observers. So we have that uh, genius are closed by composition. Okay, if we have a genio, it's better if I let you read. If I have two genios uh, between compatible pairs, F1 and F2, I can compose them and I get a new genios with respect to the composition of the homomorphism that are associated to each genio. Uh, if you have a one Lipschitz function from uh, Rn, uh, where did I, from Rn to R, you can use this function, and you have also n genios, you can use this one Lipschitz functions uh, to compose the ge these genios, and what you get is a new genio with respect to the new, to the um, previously defined homomorphism between the group. Uh, if we consider uh, suitable one Lipschitz functions, we get these three properties. They are simple but quite useful. The first property is that genios are electives. You take your genios, when you take the maximum between two genios, it is still a genio. The minimum between two genios is still a genio. Okay? Translation. If you translate a genio, you get a genio. If you consider the convex combination of genius, this is just the property of convexity of the space, this is still another genius. So we have tools to produce new genius. Imagine this, think about this. I am asked to find a genius for uh, functions, uh, let me say, uh, C1 functions defined on R2 with respect to the group of isometries. Let, let me say, okay. Uh, maybe I can have some genius, okay, F1, F2, uh, and F3. This uh, simple proposition says that I can compose this genius and get an infinite number of new genius. So I can look in this infinite family, starting just from three genius, for example. I have to work uh, on the simplex generated by this uh, genius. Uh, I, I can get uh, uh, from this genius a, an infinite family, a space of genius where we can look for the best uh, uh, approximation of the observer. Now I'm going to, this talk is just uh, to let you know the general ideas of this uh, approach. Obviously there are plenty of details I'm hiding. Uh, permutant measures, okay, maybe, maybe you know that uh, each group uh, equivalent operator can be obtained by integrating on the group, on the group G. Okay, this is well known for, near, uh, for neural networks. Okay, you wish to have an equivalent operator with respect to a group. There is a method by integrating on the group to obtain group equivalent operator. What is the problem? The problem is that the, the group could be huge. So you have to integrate of a huge group but we can do something different. We can consider permuted measures. So let us consider, this is a, 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 a case, a particular case. Let us consider the set phi of the functions defined on a finite set. So I have just uh, n points. For each point, I have a number. So in practice, I have Rn. OK, this is the set of functions. And I consider the group of bijections uh, between x uh, to x, of all permutation of x. What is uh, a, a permuted measure? 
A permutant measure is a finite signed measure mu defined on the group of permutation of x uh, uh, such that with respect to the group G we have chosen, such that uh, every subset of uh, uh, the group of permutation is measurable with respect to this signed measure. And mu is invariant under the conjugacy action of G. That means that mu of H is equal to mu of G composed G composed the inverse of G. You can have, I, I will give you some exa one example about this. Okay, one or two, I do not remember. I have to check on my slides. Uh, you can, uh, sometimes you can uh, get a finite number of permutation of a domain such that you have a measure that is invariant under the conjugacy action. If you have this, you can build a, a, a geo this way. Uh, for each uh, admissible data phi, you can consider the image defined this way. You consider the sum over uh, the, the set of any possible bijection of H of the functions phi composed the inverse of H times the measure of the permutation H. What is the advantage of this uh, method? The advantage is, is that in many cases, the support of this sum is quite small. So you have to sum, in, you have many zeros in this sum. You have just to sum on a small set. I will give you an example. Let me give you this example. We take, uh, uh, the vertices of a cube, okay? And uh, so X is a set of the vertices of a cube in R3. And we consider the group G of the orientation preserving isometry of R3 that take X to X. This is a group of cardinality 24. We have 24 preser uh, orientation preserving transformation that takes the cube to the cube. For each point, we have eight choices. Okay? And for each choice of the image, you have three edges, and you can rotate uh, in three different ways. So you have eight times three possible orientation-preserving permutation that preserves the cube. Okay? Now we consider uh, this set that is given by three permutation, H1, H2, and H3, permutation of the vertices of a cube. H1 is defined this way. We take this plane and we consider this symmetry. This is not an element in G. Okay? This transformation does not preserve the orientation. But it doesn't matter. Uh, this uh, 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 reflection is H1. The reflection with respect to this plane is H2. And the reflection with respect to this plane is H3. If you consider an orientation preserving uh, isometry of a cube, and you uh, composed this uh, orientation preserving isometry G with HI, and then you, you compose with uh, the inverse of G, you get another element in this set H1, H2, H3. For example, if you take your cube, consider this reflection. Okay, you have your cube, this is the reflection. Okay, if you uh, rotate your cube, your cube of uh, uh, 90 degrees, and then you consider this reflection, and then you can't rotate your cube, you obtain the reflection with respect to this plane. I, I take the cube, instead of con computing immediately this reflection, I rotate this way, 90 degree, then I compute this symmetry, and then I counter-rotate. What you have done is the reflection with respect to this element. So, by conjugation, you transform H1 into H2. And if, if you consider any possible element in G, you obtain that the conjugation preserve H, the set H1, H2, H3. And now we can define uh, a permutant measure by saying that uh, the measure of the uh, singletons H1, H2, H3 is a positive constant, constant, for example, 1 over 3. And then you say that the other singletons of the other permutation takes the value 0. This is a permutant measure. 
okay? And the important thing is that the support of this permutant measure is free. Since just for free permutations, you have a non-zero values. So when you consider the previous sum, this sum, you have just to sum free addends, not 24. So you have transformed the problem of finding an integral, of computing an integral on G on the problem of integrating on the, on the set H. You have to integrate with respect to the, the permuted measure. Okay? And you obtain a genome. And uh, we have this theorem. We have this representation theorem. Let us assume that G is a group of permutations on the set X that transitively acts on the finite set X and that F is a map from X to X, uh, to R, from Rx to Rx. Then the map F is a linear genio with respect to the identity between these two perception pair if and only if F can be obtained uh, through a permuton measure. Uh, and uh, the total mass of a permuton measure is, is less than one. So if you use the method of permuton measures, you do not lose any linear genome. This is quite important. But the good news is that you haven't to integrate on the group G. You have to integrate on a different group, or not on a group, on a different set. They can be much smaller, okay? This is the good news in my, in my opinion. Okay, obviously I cannot prove this now, but if someone is interested, I can give, I can give details. It would be interesting to, to see what happens in the topological case, since this is just the finite case. Uh, two applications, a toy application and a real application. Uh, let us consider this, this toy example. We have uh, dice, okay? Real dice and fake dice. In real dice, the sum of, of two opposite phases is always seven, okay? But in this fake die, we have that the sum is not seven. For example, in this case, we have four here and three adjacent. So you cannot find this uh, on the market, okay? We have produced many dice, and we have seen what happens if we apply genius to this kind of information. And the result, in my opinion, is uh, interesting. Okay, this is just a toy example. I'm not saying that in order to compare real dice and fake dice, this is a better way to, to go. No, it is not true. There are plenty of ways to do that more efficiently, okay? But what happens? We have considered, uh, we have produced randomly 10,000 dice. Uh, we have a training set of 7,000 and a test set of 3,000. And then we have computed the uh, uh, principal component analysis, the first two uh, coordinate, okay? So what is a, di a die in this model? We have uh, six phases and we have a function defined on R3. The value is zero inside the die and outside, but on the boundary, you have values, and the values describe the images defined on the six phases. So the die is a function. For each function, you can compute, in this case, you can compute two principal components. So you have two coordinates, you have a point. Each point in this image is a die. The blue points are real dies, the orange points are fake dies. And this is the distribution of information if you are, uh, consider the information without applying genius. If we consider permutant measures, and we consider in, in, uh, what we have done is considering the permutant measure I have defined previously in the example, and also uh, two other permutant measures, quite simpler, of cardinality, where the support has cardinality uh, one, just the symmetry, and in the other case, I guess, one, two, three, I guess. So just a small set, okay? And then we have genius, 
a genial for the first permutant measure, F1, a genial for the second permutant measure, F2, and the genial for the third permutant measure. And now we can apply convexity. We can consider a convex combination of these three genials. What we get is this. You can see the difference. Real dyes are um, um, given more clearly in the, in the image. And now, obviously, it's easier to separate uh, the, the data. This is the main idea. Genius are kind of observers that change information in, in order to make it more readable in some sense. OK, this is a real application. This is an application uh, con um, concerning uh, pocket de detection in proteins. We have proteins and pockets. Uh, this is a protein. This is the protein uh, 2QWE. And you can see some pockets, some cavities where you can have that uh, other molecules can, uh, can bind. We can have a bond between our molecules uh, and, uh, and uh, proteins by means of these cavities. So it's important to know where these cavities are. And you can see here uh, colors uh, uh, referring to different cavities with uh, numbers referring to the quality of the cavity. In this application, we have considered uh, three different description of cavity through a. Ah, che ore sono? Oh, okay. I stop here. I just uh, show you what happens if we consider if we consider the results of this experiment. This is, uh, we have compared state of the art method to find cavities. And uh, uh, these are described here, P2 rank, deep pocket, and so on. And this is the line corresponding to Genionet, a shallow net based on Genius. And you can compare the results. I have no time to uh, say the details of this application. Please consider that Genionet uses 17 parameters. Deep Pocket uh, uses uh, uh, 600,000 parameters. This is the advantage of using uh, operators that are focused on some properties of data. And that's it. This is the, 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 our purpose, the final purpose. This is uh, science fiction. This is not reality. But our, our idea is that instead of building uh, uh, great networks of neurons, building small networks of genius that are more transparent and more clear to read. This is our, our purpose. I skip this. In case someone is interested, I can uh, give, uh, obviously, copies of, uh, of the papers. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for being late. Mi sono accorto di aver fatto tardi. Mi dispiace. I guess it, so it's just a curiosity. I think, uh, you know, I was very curious about this kind of invariance, especially when you talk about convolutional neural network, they seem to have all these properties. But then at least, you know, there are problems and problems. And at least in these kind of high dimensional vision problems, it looks like in the end, the way invariance is actually injected into the system is through data, by just doing augmented data, which speaks to the fact that perhaps the, the architecture itself is not that much invariant, or at least maybe, or, or is doing something else. But I mean, you see what I'm saying, you know. There was a description that I had in my head that the invariance is built in in the architecture, but then why would you have to do it through data? And so I wonder what you think about this comment. And I still think that, you know, this, the opportunity to inject uh, invariance by design can be interesting. Maybe not, you know, in image classification in other problems. And so maybe it's a question of context. But again, it's an open question. Uh, I have no precise answer to this question. What I think is this. There is an interval, 0, 1. 
when we have no knowledge about uh, invariants uh, and we have no experience to transfer in some sense to the machine, it is not a good idea to use Geneos. And in this case, uh, other method in machine learning uh, can, be, uh, can be used. When we have perfect knowledge uh, and we are at the position one, in that case, for example, if I ask you what is the uh, length, or I have a, a right uh, triangle, okay, and I have the, the, the two data concerning two uh, sides, there is no purpose in uh, training, uh, in my opinion, a neural network uh, or using genius in order to compute the other side. You know the formula, so you have a perfect knowledge. But there is plenty of cases where you know that something is interesting. For example, in the case of dice, you know that maybe there is some relationship with symmetries, since we know that we are working with dice. And the, uh, the observer can tell us, uh, OK, I know that maybe there is some interesting information in symmetries. I do not know what is the link. But maybe it could be interesting. So I can select a family of genius that are defined uh, uh, on the basis uh, of, of these equivalents, on permuted measures. And then I restrict my selection the navigation in the space to genius that are equivalent in respect to this group. So I guess that the, um, we are not inserting the information from data. We are inserting information that is given by previous observers that speak to us and say, we know that probably there is some link you could get from this kind of information. It is, why, uh, it is what we do when we speak to experts. Uh, we look for people that is, uh, uh, that knows quite well many examples concerning that problem. Uh, anyway, I cannot answer your question.